It's knowing that you have a great future that helps you get through a not so great present. And if by chance you are having a great present, that's beautiful. Love that. I'd like to have times in our life when things are good. But there are many people today who are not having such a great present. These are the ones who really appreciate and look forward to their great future. See, the Christian life is about hope for the future. Our series is entitled, Christ, Hope for the Future. And it's intended to make you hopeful for heaven. And I hope it's doing that for you. That we don't think enough about heaven. I wonder, I wonder, if we thought about heaven more, I wonder how much that would affect our life here on the earth, our thought process, our choices, how we use our energies with more of a heavenly mindset, I think would alter the earthly mindset that we have. We're going to take a trip back in time to the days of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. This was about mm, 550 years before Christ. The king had a dream. It was a troubling dream. Have you ever had a troubling dream? Anybody? I had a weird dream the other night. I was sleeping and I dreamed I was eating this giant marshmallow. And I woke up, and my pillow was gone. <laughs> this is the weirdest dream sometimes. Nebuchadnezzar's dream was even more weird than that. It was more troubling than that. In Daniel chapter 2, we pick it up in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. And then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and they stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Now, all the wise men and the magicians, they said, okay, king, tell us the dream, and we'll interpret it for you. But the king figured, oh, if I tell them what the dream is, they'll make up some story, some fake, phony interpretation, and uh, I don't think I'm really going to get the answer I'm looking for. So he wouldn't tell them the dream. Who can interpret a dream when you've never heard the dream? That, that's a tough thing to do. And unless you're really in touch with God, who gives divine revelation, it's impossible to interpret a dream that you have never heard. And the king said to them, if you can't tell me the interp interpretation of the dream, you're all going to die. I'm going to, like, execute all of you if you can't tell me the interpretation of what I dreamed. Man, like, did you ever notice there are certain days you felt it was better to stay home than go to work. This was one of those days. This is one of those days I'm sure these guys said, oh man, I knew I should have called in sick. I knew this wasn't going to be. You know it's not going to be a good day when the king says, tell me what I dreamed, interpret it, or I'm going to kill you. And you don't know what he dreamed. You know that's not going to be a good day. And they couldn't interpret the dream because they didn't know it. So the king called for their execution. Daniel was put in charge of their execution. But Daniel reasoned with the king to spare them. And Daniel said that he would tell the meaning of the dream. Like, wow, that's bold. How is it that Daniel could say, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you, king, what that dream meant? You know how? Because you know what he did? He went home. And he got his friends together, and they prayed. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. They prayed for the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And you know what? God gave it. Like, 
It's amazing the things God will tell us if we really sit down and pray. If you really do. I mean, take the time and go to God. It's amazing the things he'll tell you, the answers that he'll give you. Like we sang this morning, when we surrender, we get to know him more and more and more. And in our prayer life, we know the one that we're praying to. And we know he wants the best for us. We know that. So Daniel had that faith. He, he returned and told the king what the dream was all about. Wow. He said, king, here's what you dreamed. And here's what it means. And the dream was about the rise and fall of kingdoms to come after Nebuchadnezzar. The dream also revealed that God would set up another kingdom, a kingdom that would last forever. It was a picture of hope for the future. Notice in verse 31 of Daniel 2, Daniel is speaking to the king and he said, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. This is the dream. That statue, oh, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you. And its appearance was awesome. The head of the statue was made of fine gold, its breasts and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze. Verse 33, its legs were made of iron, its feet partly iron, partly clay. The materials in the statue represented other kingdoms after Nebuchadnezzar. And as you came down the statue, the materials became less valuable from gold to silver to bronze to iron to clay, which shows that the kingdoms weren't as powerful as the original. You continued looking until a stone was cut out, oh, without hands. And it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Verse 35, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, ah, oh, they were crushed all at the same time. And they became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. In other words, like the shell of the grain. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. It's like these kingdoms were all demolished and they were gone. No even evidence of their existence. The wind carried them away. But the stone that struck the statue, oh, that became a great mountain. And it filled the whole earth. Notice in verse 44. And the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people, you know, like those other kingdoms were. Oh, no, it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has, men, has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true. It's an, it's, its interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel said, the dream is about all these kingdoms of the world. One day, they're all going to be crushed by another kingdom. And this kingdom is going to endure forever. Now, the Jews thought that they were that kingdom. They figured, that's us, Israel. We're going to crush these kingdoms, and we're going to endure forever. And then it's like, uh-oh, Jesus shows up. And he came preaching. And you know what he came preaching? The kingdom of God is coming, not with signs and wonders to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or behold, there it is. No, the kingdom of God is in your midst. What Jesus was saying was, the kingdom of God is here. It's in me. 
I'm the kingdom of God. I'm here. I'm bringing the new kingdom. Jesus is the rock that will crush all kingdoms. But you know, before that happens, man, something terrible has to happen. He has to be crushed. He will be crushed for us. In Isaiah chapter 53, we have a commentary, again, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 4. Here's what Isaiah said about the coming Messiah when he arrives one day. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It's all about his being crushed. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's all of our sins. He was judged for them. The chastening for our well-being, the punishment, fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, think about it, all people, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Now here's the grace of God. But the Lord has called the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He would be crushed for us. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. But he never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. You know, he never defended himself. Pilate said to him, answer me. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus didn't say anything. He said, don't you know I have the authority to have you crucified or set you free? <laughs> Jesus looks him right in the eye. The only, the only authority you have is what my father gives you. You have no authority. Your authority comes from God. God put you here. So I'm not afraid of you. He never opened up his mouth. He never defended himself. Why? Because he couldn't stop himself from going to the cross. That's why he came. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people in whom the, the stroke was due. In other words, he died for the sins of the world. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Huh. That means he would die between wicked men. Thief on his left, a thief on his right. And then he was with a rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, went to Pilate and said, I would like the body of Jesus. I'd like to bury him in my tomb. And he gave him the body, and they placed Jesus in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man. Uh -huh, all prophesied 700 years before it happened. So he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Wow. Never said anything deceitfully against anyone. We know we're all guilty, aren't we? Every one of us. But he never did. In verse 10, the Lord was pleased to crush him. It pleased God the Father to crush his son. How could, I can't think of a father that would be pleased to see his son crushed like Jesus was. But God the Father was. Why? Because God the Father, you know what he did? It's like, and I hope I'm not being heretical with this, it's like he took the responsibility for us and for our sin. He took the responsibility. I created them. They fell into sin. They were alienated from me. They were all lost. Well, I will step in. And I will take that responsibility, and I will restore them. 
with my son. That's why God the Father could be pleased. He knew the outcome. Isaiah said, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. We are his offspring by faith. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge and the right of the righteous one. My servant will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. That's us. We're the many. We are the many. This is why we rejoice. I was thinking about, oh, why do I go to church besides being the pastor? Because I went to church before I was the pastor. And you know why I go to church? Because I'm grateful. I'm grateful to God for what he did for me. That's why. That's a big reason of why we come. We're grateful to God for what he did. What did he do? He rescued us. He delivered us through his son from eternal wrath. He bore our iniquities so we don't have to. So we've got all of these prophecies about the Messiah coming and being crushed and crucified. The Jews wouldn't accept this. The Jews would not accept that the Messiah would come and be crucified for them. And you know what's weird? There are many, many millions of people today. They don't accept it either. Most of the people in the world right now, most of them, do not accept the fact that Jesus Christ came and was crucified and bore the judgment for their sin. That is like, that is like, I don't even know what it's like. He has become, the Bible calls, a rock of offense. That people are offended by the name of Jesus Christ. They're offended to think that they would need a savior. They're offended that a God, that they would want to come down and make everybody's life perfect, would actually come down and die. It's an, it's an offense to them. Paul quotes the Old Testament in Romans 9.33. God said, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's Israel, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. You know what the word disappointed means? To miss an appointment. You know what I think the appointment is? I think the appointment is heaven. He who believes in him will not miss their appointment in heaven. Well then, or contraire, he that does not believe in him will miss their appointment. They will be disappointed. They will not get to heaven. See, this dream was about kingdom after kingdom after kingdom in the Old Testament. But we're living in a world with many kingdoms today as well. Internationally, nations are rising up against nations. We see it on the news every day. Somebody's always invading somebody, one kingdom after another. Uh, nationally, even in our own country, kingdom promotion seems to be the latest fad, and that's carried out through protesting. People don't like what's going on, so they're going to protest, gather together by the thousands, and promote their own kingdom. Everybody's promoting their own kingdom today, their own rule of authority. We see it more and more. It's, it's the latest fad now. People don't accept righteous judgments. They protest against them. We even have protests in other countries against the things that go on in our country. I'm like, what? It's none of their business. What do they care? But they protest thousands of miles away to what goes on here. Why? Because everybody has a kingdom to promote. Socially, everyone has to have their say. Everybody has an opinion. 
But you know what? There isn't much give and take in the name of tolerance because people are not very tolerant. People that want tolerance only want tolerance for those that agree with them. But they don't have any tolerance for those that disagree. Why? Because it's kingdom against kingdom. And you know what? Even personally, even in your heart, in mine, in our life, in yourself, there is a struggle. There's a struggle. And you know it because life can be very frustrating. That's why we have to continue to look to the rock. See, the rock will come and crush all the kingdoms. And he will become the enduring kingdom. Nothing's going to last. Nothing. There's not one trophy. There's not a ward. There's no Stanley Cup. There's no Super Bowl trophy. There's no green jacket. There's nothing that's going to last except the kingdom of God. Everything will be gone, and so will be the record of it. History books will be closed. There'll be no history once God establishes his enduring kingdom. One day Jesus will come, he'll remove every kingdom, and he will establish his own. He had to be crushed. When he returns, he will return to crush. He's coming back, and he will crush every kingdom. He will crush every kingdom internationally, nationally, socially, personally, every kingdom will be crushed, and he will establish his own. You know what I would say? Don't make him a rock of offense. Make him the rock that you stand on. He can be the rock that you trip over and fall. That's a stumbling stone. Or he can be the rock that you stand on, the foundation of your life. There's nothing else, you know, there's no other foundation that can stand except Christ the rock. There's no other foundation. Health, finances, a good life, nothing will stand. Not one kingdom will stand. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 7. He told a story about two builders. He said, these two guys built a house. They went down to the beach. They like beach houses. How many here like beach houses? I like beach houses. Seems like whenever I rent a beach house, the floors are always slanted. That's why I don't like beach houses as much as I should. But it's nice to have a house on the beach. So these guys built houses like next door to each other. Actually, the literal story, it wasn't really on the beach. It was in a dry riverbed. And not thinking when the rainy season comes, ooh, water's coming down the riverbed. So they built these two houses. Maybe they were buddies, they were friends, you know, had kids, kids grew up together, went to the same school, they played on the same softball team. They did a lot together. Let's build houses together on the beach. Okay. So they built these houses. One guy's house went up really fast. Wow. He just got the wood, made the floor, put the walls up, the roof, man, he was in. The other guy's still building. It took him a long time to build that house. It was extra work. It's a lot of work. And then they both moved into their houses. They moved their families into the houses. They brought the pets into the houses, the dogs, the cats, the birds, the goldfish, grandma. Everybody came in the houses, right? Everybody. And then one day, a storm of the century came. And it came, and Jesus said, that storm came, and it blew, and the rains came, and the winds came, and beat against those houses. And those houses were shaking and rumbling, and the people inside were like, oh, this is a bad storm. And then he said, one house blew apart, and it was washed away. 
And the other house, it withstood the storm and it lasted. And somebody would say, oh, what's the difference? The storm that lasted was built on a rock. It had a foundation that could not be moved. The rock was so big, nothing could move it. Not even the storm of the century could move that rock. It was huge, big enough to build a house on. But the other house, oh, shortcuts. Shortcuts never get it done. You want a shortcut to a happy life? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There are no shortcuts to a happy life. This guy took a shortcut. I'm going to build my house real quick. I'm going to be in it. He's still working. And when the storm of the century came, the house fell. And you know what Jesus said? Great was that fall. You know why it was a great fall? Because it wasn't just him that lost his life. His wife, his children, the dog, the cat, the birds, the goldfish, grandma, everybody. Everybody perished. See, when you take a shortcut, you're not just playing with your life. You're playing with the lives of people around you, people that love you, people that trust you. They look to you. You're playing with their lives. The other house, it stood because it was founded on a rock, something that couldn't be moved by the biggest storm in life. I would ask you today, because you know what? Every one of us in this room today are building a life. We're all building a house. But I want to ask you, and you answer this in your own heart, what are you building your house on? Seriously, honestly, what are you building your house on? Are you building it on shifting sand and, hey, as long as things are good, life is good. Nothing wrong with that. But when things aren't good, the sand moves and the house comes down. When, like we song, sang that song today, when addiction comes, when sickness comes, when things come that we have no control over, what are we standing on? Are you standing on something that can hold you up? Or are you standing on something that's going to wash you away? That's because that's what it'll do. It'll wash you away. We're here today because we are building our life on the rock. The rock is Christ. That's what we're doing today. But we're going to keep building. And you're going to keep looking to the rock. Look to the rock. Look to the rock. Look to the rock. The Bible says it over and over and over. Look to the rock. Don't forget about the rock. Don't forget about the foundation that you're building your life on. Because I'll tell you what, the storm's coming. No one is exempt from a storm. No one. No one is going to come. And it doesn't have to be devastating when your life is on the rock. Christ is our rock. He's our rock. He's what we stand on. He's what we build our lives on. There's so much sadness in the world. I'll bet every one of us knows somebody that's really sad today for all kinds of reasons. And there's a lot of sadness in the world, I believe, that doesn't have to be. It doesn't. That that sadness can change into joy. It can. But the life has to be built on the rock. And you can't veer off the rock. You can't put a house half on the foundation and half off the foundation. That's like no foundation. You can't build your life in Christ once in a while. I think I'll go to church this month once. Christmas, Easter. You know, I got my own church. Oh, what's the name of it? St. Mattress. That's a good one. You got to be on the foundation 
totally and completely. And you will stand. Your house will stand. Your life will stand. When the storm comes, oh man, the doozy of a storm, the one we never expected. I can't believe that this happened. I can't believe it happened to me. There are things that happen to people. We go, man, that was terrible. And then one day, I can't believe it happened to me. It happens. That's why we need that rock. Build your life on the rock. If you've been building your life on the rock, beautiful. Keep doing it. If you haven't, man, start now. Make a commitment today. I've got to get my life in Christ. Because I don't know what waits for me out there. There's some stuff out there. Oh, man, I don't know what's waiting for me out there. But it's bigger than me. It's bigger than us. There are things in life that, that are going to happen. We can't control them. We have no control. But we can be steady in the storm. When that storm comes, hey, all you can be is steady. That's it. And you know what? If you stay steady in the storm, the storm will pass. And you survive. A lot of folks sink in the storm because they can't stay steady. They don't have what it takes. Like when a, when a boat is in a storm on the sea, what the captain needs to do, he needs to point the bow into the waves. That's all he's going to do. Just keep that boat pointed into the wave. Because if he goes sideways, the wave will come and roll him over. So he's just going to keep her steady, break through the wave, get that bow in the wave, and he'll probably do okay. That's what we have to do. Stay steady. Get your bow in the wave. And don't, let, don't turn, don't veer, and let them roll you over and take you down. So maybe today is just a good day to think, oh, what have I been building my life on? You can have a great career. That's good. People should have great careers. You could have great relationships. You could have great health. You could have great anything. Name it, anything. But it's all sand. It's all sand. Because there's only one rock. There's just one. It's Christ. To some, he's the rock of offense. They're offended. Hmm? To others, he's the rock on which they stand. And when that storm of life comes, I'm on the rock. This house that wasn't on the rock, great was its fall. Great. You know what the word is? Mega. There's a mega fall. That's big, like mega fries. You eat mega fries, shame on you. <laughs> Unless you share them with 10 people. It was great. What am I building my life on? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is that rock. There is no other. That he is who he says he is. He did what the Bible says he would come to do. And Father, for those of us that, are, that have the assurance of Christ in our life, help us to continue to build on that, to prepare for the upcoming storms of life, and they will come. For those that are in the storms right now, Lord, may you continue to strengthen. Hold them together with your precious, powerful word. And I just want to take a minute. Hey, maybe you haven't been building on the rock. That's okay. You're here today. And you can start today. Today can be a new day for you. You can even be in this church for 10 years and you never built on a rock. You just came to church. Oh, I go to church. I go to New Hope. I'm okay. No, you're not okay. You're not okay because you go to New Hope Christian Church. You're only okay because Jesus Christ is your Savior. It doesn't matter what church you go to. Is Christ your Savior? Is He the rock? that you put your hope in for heaven. Because there's nothing else that will get you to heaven but Christ. 
And there's nothing else that will keep you steady in the storm but Christ. He is our rock. If you're not really sure of your eternal future and you want to be sure, we can fix that right now. I'm just going to pray a little prayer. It's a prayer of faith. And if you agree with this prayer in your heart and say, yes, God, that's my prayer. I'm believing what he's saying. That's the prayer that will give you salvation, forgiveness, eternal life. That's the prayer that will give you a foundation, Christ, that you can now begin to build your life on. So let's pray. Dear God in heaven, I know I need a savior. And I know that Jesus Christ is that savior. Oh, to some, he's a rock of offense. They're offended by him, but not me. Because now I understand. Now I understand that he's the rock that came to help me build a life. To hold me steady in the storm. To keep me safe and secure. To hold my head above the floodwaters. I know he can do that for me. And I know that his sacrifice on the cross and his shed blood covered oh, all my sins. And I can stand before you holy and righteous. And I want to do that, God. So I acknowledge today that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And there's no other way that I can be saved but through faith in him, who he is and what he did. Amen.